Sponsored by the James Madison Council and the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Nancy Cordes, Chief White House Correspondent for CBS News, and I'm here with three esteemed authors to talk to them about their latest books. They are David O. Stewart, the author of George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father, Kai Bird, author of The Outlier, The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter, and James Oakes, the author of The Crooked Path to Abolition, Abraham Lincoln, and The Anti-Slavery Constitution. If you want to learn more about our authors, you can go to loc.gov, loc.gov, slash bookfest. Now, before I begin, I want to let you know that we're going to save at least the last 10 minutes of this 30-minute live event to respond to audience questions so you can start submitting your questions right now. The theme of our National Book Festival this year is open a book, open the world. So I want to ask our three panelists as we kick off this event to tell us how have books opened the world to you. And uh, Kai, perhaps I'll start with you, uh, but I'd love for this to be as much of a conversation as possible, despite, despite the fact that we are separated by technology. So please, uh, all of you, feel free to jump in and weigh in on, on, on what the others have said. Well, thank you, Nancy. Um, books, well, uh, you know, I've written six biographies now and a memoir, and in each case, I, uh, the motivation is for me to try to figure out what happened. So with Jimmy Carter, I, as a young man, I was a reporter here in Washington, DC, uh, and was reporting on the Carter administration. And I didn't understand a lot about what was happening at the time, and certainly didn't understand his defeat to Ronald Reagan in 1980. And uh, so for years, I was curious to try to revisit this era and figure out what exactly had been happening around me um, and to figure out what had happened to Jimmy Carter and who was this most improbable president who came from the deep south and most improbably won the 76 election. And, uh, you know, was he a failed president or, uh, uh, just a very successful ex-president, as many Americans think. And actually, when I got into the archives, I discovered otherwise, that he was a very consequential president. So books do that. They change your mind. David? Well, I'd have to say uh, it's always mattered to me. Uh, I was the six-year-old kid who read the encyclopedia, um, sometimes mocked for it. Uh, and I just have always loved reading history and uh, stories, uh, true or not true. Um, and I think it's how we get our minds to work. Uh, it's, you know, one of the striking things about George Washington, I, I discovered uh, researching about him is he didn't have a very good formal education, just a two or three years of school. Uh, but he was a self-taught guy who spent his whole life accumulating books and reading them and caring about them. Uh, if he came up on problems that he couldn't deal with very well, he, he would look for a book that would help him. So uh, I just think it's a, a wonderful gateway to someone else's mind, some, somebody who's thought about things that in a way that's gonna be awfully interesting to you. How about you, James? Were you a six-year-old encyclopedia reader as well? Well, not quite, but books were in many ways the thing that took me out of my world into other worlds. And that's that's what they do. And it, it can be a novel, it can be a history book, it can be a science book. And that's what books have always been for me. And, and writing books, my experience of writing books is similar to the to the points David made. When you go into another world, like the 19th century uh, world of politics, slavery, and anti-slavery, and you deal with, deeply deal with people like Frederick Douglass or Abraham Lincoln, for me, it, it, it tells me 
it teaches me to be humble about the past, uh, to recognize that people at the time may may well have been a lot smarter than we are, may have understood things better than we do. And it's important to analyze the past and uh, to analyze it empathetically. That's what I think writing books has One of the things that I thought was fascinating about all of your books, all of which have been heralded uh, for providing us with a much deeper, uh, more nuanced appreciation of your subjects than, than we had before, was the fact that you all chose subjects that you know, we might think we, we know everything about already. Um, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Jimmy Carter. So I'd love to know from each of you how you chose your subjects and, and what led you to believe that there was more to their stories that hadn't already been told? Oh, well, I, I stumbled into Jimmy Carter because uh, I was looking for a new book project. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm adrift if I'm not writing a book. And I got the notion that I wanted to do a president. And, you know, uh, the good thing about presidential biographies is that there are presidential libraries. And this is an enormous resource, of an archive with, that houses all of their presidential papers, classified and unclassified and the declassified papers. And I knew uh, six years ago when I started this project that Jimmy Carter's papers were largely open. Probably 75% of them are open. And uh, unlike, for instance, Ronald Reagan's papers, which are 85 or 90% closed uh, still, uh, Carter's papers were accessible. And so I knew for a fact that I would find great new stories, anecdotes um, about the Iran revolution and the hostage crisis and his grappling with stagflation in the 1970s. And uh, it was just a great story filled with colorful figures uh, like Miss Lillian, his mother, who was an eccentric Southern gentlewoman who spoke her mind and uh, Billy Carter and uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski and Cy Vance and Hamilton Jordan and uh, Jody Powell. These were all very colorful, um, outspoken Southerners who, uh, were very colorful figures. And so I had a lot of fun doing this book. How about you, James? How did you go into this project convinced that you were going to be able to tell us something uh, about Abraham Lincoln that we didn't already know? Well, I had a suspicion that I would find something uh, because uh, the books I've been writing over the past decade and a half are sort of been prompted by the questions I had when I finished the previous book. I finished a book on Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, wondering why it took so long for slavery to be abolished during the Civil War, and that produced my next book. When I wrote the, wrote the next book, I realized that there was something going on in the United States and American politics long before uh, the Civil War began that helped me explain what had happened during the Civil War. One of the things I ripped up on was this constant talk about uh, and the references to it as if it were an anti-slavery document. And I was raised, I believe, I was taught at a fairly young age that the Constitution was what William Lloyd Garris, the great abolitionist, said it was, a, a pro-slavery document. Finding people who, as I said the last time, I respected, were very smart, like Frederick Graham Lincoln and thousands and thousands of others who didn't believe what Garrison said, who believed the Constitution was, by and large, an anti-slavery document. So I started looking and seeing where that stuff came from and able to show how uh, the way Abraham Lincoln talked about slavery cannot be understood outside of his understanding of the Constitution and the way he treated slavery and the way the Republican Party treated slavery during the Civil War cannot be understood outside of their understanding of the Constitution. It was very, very different from the understanding I had. 
And, and David, in your case, you really managed to give us uh, a much different picture of George Washington, particularly as a young man, uh, than I think we would have expected. Did you know going into this project that you, uh, that you would be able to do that? Well, it was a little like the scientific method. I had a hypothesis and uh, I, I hoped it would turn out to be true. Um, I had done three books on the founding era and whenever I went out and spoke to real people, which is always the best part, um, many times I would be asked, so who was the most important person? And I would always say George Washington. And after I had done that a few dozen times, it occurred to me that maybe I was missing the point and I ought to look into this Washington guy. Um, and it just seemed to me as I looked at it that he was an extraordinary politician. And we don't think of him that way. We think of him as a soldier. We think of him as a uh, farmer, um, as a patriot but not as a politician, um, but he was a very deft political operator. And so I wondered, where did that come from? And there is a trajectory I was able to discover um, where he has an early great success as a very young man in his 20, early 20s uh, in military matters, diplomatic matters, and then he sort of crashes and burns. He has... Uh, a, a real failure. And it's largely because he's gotten more responsibility than he can handle. And then he reacts badly to it and he behaves badly. Uh, and then there is a period which is often ignored. 16 years when he's not a soldier, he's back at Mount Vernon. He serves in the House of Burgesses. He's a legislator longer than he's a soldier. Uh, he becomes a county court judge. He serves on his church vestry, which had lots of public responsibilities. And he learns how to deal with people, how to lead. And it's an extraordinary reinvention. Uh, and by the time he then becomes commander in chief of the Continental Army in 1974, he's the George Washington we know, that we recognize. Um, the fellow who left public service when he was 27 years old is not. He, that fellow was brash, unwise, sarcastic about his superiors. Um, and the fellow, by the time, uh, by 1774, when he takes over, 1775, he takes over the army, he's, he's George Washington. And that reinvention um, is a fascinating story to me. And, and it's there. You have to sort of coax it out, but it's there. Well, wow. you know, one of the things I, I often find myself doing when I'm reading a great, really detailed book, and I imagine a lot of uh, readers have the same experience, is I start picturing the author, you know, writing it. How did they do this? Where did they get their, their information? How did they collate it? Can you just kind of take us inside your process, each of you? Um, how much time do you spend researching? Uh, how far afield are you going to get your um, to get your first person documents? Are you writing while you're researching? Are you uh, or are you you know working in two very distinct phases, the research phase and the writing phase? Just give us a little insight into your process. Well, uh, let me jump in here. I uh, actually, when I wrote my first biography uh, on John McCloy uh, some thirty years ago. I, I spent years doing the research and outlining each chapter. I sometimes spent more time outlining the chapter than I did writing the chapter. <laughs> um, and on my second book, I threw away that approach. And uh, so on the Jimmy Carter book, this time around, I spent a year doing some research and spending five, six months in his archives, copying thousands of pages, about 20,000 pages of archival documents. I did a, a number of interviews, dozens of interviews. And then I started to write. And uh, I, tried to, I try to write every day, just a little bit. I give myself a target of 350 words per day. Well, that's not very much. My wife complains, you know, you're not working very hard. But uh, <laughs> it's... It's, uh, it's, 
it has to be a good 350 words that are part of a narrative and tell a story. So I go to sleep every night thinking about what funny, clever anecdote that I want to write up the next morning. And then I get up and that gets me started. And it's a, you know, writing a book is a hard thing. It's a daily process. And so I attack it by um, doing little pieces of it. And uh, after, you know, if you're, you're writing 350 words a day, after a few years, you, <laughs> you've got a narrative. And then of course you're going back and editing and you're always doing more research because you actually never know what you don't know until you start to write. And then you have to go back into the archives or go online and find this fact or that fact. And uh, so it's a very, uh, uh, very complicated and hard process, but uh, it can be fun. You ever find yourself getting swept away and writing 700 good words in a day? <laughs> Sometimes, yes. <laughs> uh, how about you, Dave? I have to say it's never fun for me. No? <laughs> no, I find it, I, I find it excruciatingly painful to write. And uh, I, I have amnesia about how I wrote. I cannot tell you. I pick up a book I wrote and I said, when did I write? How did I write this? I don't know wow. where this came from. Uh, and every, I can say that every book I've written seems to have been written in a very different way from the, from the credit. One, one book was a, a set of were reworked and my, it was written in a very traditional way. I went to the archives, I collected notes, I organized the notes, I, I wrote from the notes, but that's the last time I ever wrote a book that way. Honestly, can't tell you. They sort of come from the questions I'm asking and whatever I'm asking or, or problem I'm trying to fill out to explain. Uh, it's where I go looking for sources, and they're all over the place. They're not in the same place every time. I find them in unexpected. I find things I didn't expect, and I start packing it down, and piece by piece, somehow a book comes. Not something I is uh, easy. I will say, I will say, I enjoy revising a lot more than I enjoy writing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. How about you, David? Has your process evolved over time? I, it's probably changed some, but not a lot. Um, I do uh, start out reading some general books, you know, for the era or, you know, with Washington, you know, big biographies of him. Um, and then I stopped doing that because, you, you know, they start, you know, it's more of the same. And I really focus on the original materials we have with Washington. It's, you know, 80 volumes of papers that have all been put up on online and, you know, got Hamilton's papers and Adams and everybody else's. Um, it's an amazing resource. Uh, but I want to get their voices. Um, you can hear in the actual words they choose themselves. And it's a beauty part of working in the 18th century that these people are actually writing the stuff themselves and it's not speech writers. Uh, and you get a much better sense of them. And that's, that's really what I'm after. Um, and so that is, is a major part of what I do. Um, because Washington's life has been done so much, much of the material was available online, which is amazing. Uh, my first book was just 17 years ago, and it, there wasn't that, that stuff online. Um, I tend to research and then write and research and then write. Um, I, I can't just research everything because I'll forget it by the time it's time to write it. Uh, and um, I love the writing part. Um, it's my favorite part, and I get impatient because I want to start writing. And there are some passages that just come, and there are other passages where it just feels like I'm, I'm taking out the trash. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm washing the floors, and you know, I'm just getting it done, and I'll fix it when I revise it. Um, so that they're different experiences, but yeah, you know, the the writing part's the fun. <laughs> 
Um, we are getting some really great questions. So I wanna to go to some of the audience questions now. Um, the first one is, what is one feature of each of these presidents that their successors can and should adopt? We are in a, such a punishing political era. Uh, what do you think it is about uh, each of the presidents that you wrote about that uh, might see them through in this era? Hi. Well, <clears throat> the presidency is a, an enormously difficult job. Uh, you know, each day the president has to grapple with dozens, not just one or two, but dozens of issues and personalities and politicians and ordinary people. And uh, Jimmy Carter, I think, was very good at the job. He was later criticized for paying too much attention to detail. But you know, that meant he was reading actually two or 300 pages of memos from his staff every day and writing marginal comments and uh, making, you know, decisions based on facts and studying the issues. I mean, he would get, he kept farmer's hours like he always has. He rose at 5.30 in the morning. He was in the Oval Office by 6 or 6.30. He was sometimes conducting meetings by 7 a.m. And uh, he's had a 12 hour working day. And then he'd have a uh, dinner in the White House, uh, an official dinner. And then he'd go back to the Oval Office and have a few more hours. I mean, he worked very hard at this. And uh, he hated to sort of be making political deals. He mm. wanted to sort of to do the right thing. Um, and, you know, I would argue that he is a model for what uh, the kind of president that we want, that he's, uh, he actually was one of the better read presidents. He's one of the most intelligent, hardworking, and certainly one of the more, more decent men to have occupied the White House in the 20th century. So these are qualities you'd want in a president, hardworking, attention to detail, and uh, integrity. David? Well, you asked for one quality. Um, Washington, certainly, you know, he worked 12 hour days his whole life. That's just who he was. Um, and, uh, but I think the thing I would urge his, any successor of his to um, uh, try to adopt was his commitment to integrity. Uh, he always understood that the most important thing he did was embody the presidency, that the presidency was a unique office in our system. He stands for the whole nation. And, you know, he, he can't be a goof. Um, he, he, he needs to be someone we respect, someone we think is working hard and is thinking hard and cares about people. And that you know, I, I think Washington modeled at our birth what we expect from a president, and he, he's had a, that's been his greatest gift to the country. Um, and, you know, that's what I would urge any uh, president to, to make number one. James, was there something that perhaps surprised you about Lincoln's uh, character or strategy when you were researching him that uh, you think might make for a, a good model for? current-day politicians? Well, the thing that has always that has always amazed me about Lincoln is his ability to uh, think very strategically and in a very savvy way as a politician. He was, uh, even said about Washington, who, especially of Lincoln, he was at heart a politician. And everything he said, he said strategically, and yet, he was able to do that without, while maintaining a commitment to a set of ideals that got him and the country through the greatest trial it had. You know, the, he, every, he's the only president who, who, whose entire presidency was consumed by war. And he got the country through that by maintaining a very difficult and contentious coalition that would support 
this war and see it through to the end and in the process destroy the institution of slavery that had been the cause of the war. Every single step he took was controversial. He was he could not be thin-skinned about the criticism that was leveled at him. He just kept his eye on the goal of restoring the Union, undermining slavery, and not losing the support of what he needed to get that done. Uh, I think this is a really interesting question from one audience member who asks, how much of a role did these early leaders' families and associates, much like a modern day cabinet, play in their early presidencies? Today, uh, the first lady and the, the family plays such a significant role in providing support. They are so visible. Uh, how did the, the family structure, the, the, the structure of advisors around them shape their presidency? Uh, David? Well, Washington had possibly the most talented cabinet we've ever had, and there were only four people in it, and, but he had Jefferson and Hamilton, and that was a pretty good start. Uh, and he and they fought like cats and dogs um, during cabinet meetings, and I think he loved that. I think he really enjoyed having them talk out the issues. Uh, he preferred to be the umpire. He didn't like to get into the back and forth with people, but he wanted to hear smart people talk and, and disagree with each other. He always wanted that as a soldier. Uh, he wanted it as a as a politician and get the benefit of their views. He was going to make the final decision. There was no doubt about it. But he, he did want that sort of airing. Um, we don't have any good records about Martha's contribution. Um, she clearly was terribly important in many ways, both to his own um, well-being. Uh, they were a devoted couple, but also uh, Striking the right social note was very important. You know, we never had a president. We had to know how he was going to act, how his family would act. And, and she was gracious where he could be kind of stiff. Um, and that was, I think, a great contribution she made to, to the set success of his presidency. James, how about that? Well, okay. well, as I'm sure you know, Lincoln's marriage was extremely controversial subject, <laughs> and uh, it'd be very hard to make the case that that uh, the marriage contributed in any significant way, even if you don't accept the, the most uh, falling versions of the marriage in part that, that his, his presidency relied heavily on, on uh, Mary Todd. I, I, I could go back to his childhood and say that you know, what we do know about the family he grew up in is that it was an anti-slavery family in a slaveholding state. And that he once said, uh, I always hated slavery. I remember a time when I didn't. And if you take that family background as a given, then his ability to grow and learn during the Civil War, move with pride of public opinion and guide public opinion, I think that that growth, that that family background. I'm not so sure about the marriage. Um, and, and Kai, you wrote obviously uh, not just about the, the Carter's marriage, but also the influence of Jimmy's Carter, Jimmy Carter's mother on his career. Yes, oh, absolutely. Well, Rosie, Jimmy Carter's Rosie is Rosalind Carter, and uh, she was extremely influential. She was she had a, a sharper political mind in some ways than Jimmy did. Um, she was more attuned to you know the political costs of his decisions, and she was constantly trying to urge him to take into account the politics of of a decision and not just simply do the right thing. So she, for instance, asked him, "Well, why do you have to?" work on the Panama Canal Treaty in your first term when it's so controversial and going to be politically costly to you to get those votes in the Senate. And Carter's brushed that off and said, no, I've got to do this now. Um, now, he was, he was also very heavily influenced by Lillian Carter, his, his outspoken mom, who 
uh, is the only explanation for who Jimmy Carter was in terms of coming from the Deep South, uh, uh, an extremely segregated racist society where his own father believed fervently in white supremacy and the segregation laws. And uh, Carter had none of that. He didn't have a racist bone in his body and it's all due to Miss Lillian who just raised him to understand that blacks and whites were equal. And as a nurse, she treated blacks in the same way. Carter also, you know, speaking of the of Washington's desire, George Washington's desire to have a uh, team of rivals in his cabinet and uh, hear dissenting voices and arguments, Carter was like this too. He came in determined to have a wide spectrum of views. Um, and so, for instance, he appointed Cy Vance as his Secretary of State and Zbigniew Brzezinski as his National Security Advisor. And uh, he did this over the objections and against the counsel of many people who told him, you know, these two men can't work together. And they have two different worldviews about how foreign policy should be made. And uh, and indeed, I show in my narrative that Zbig Brzezinski was a uh, near poisonous influence in the administration, constantly leaking and undermining the Secretary of State and giving, giving Jimmy Carter bad advice. He always wanted to use military force. He always wanted to confront the Soviets because as a Polish aristocrat, he hated the Russians. <laughs> and so he saw the whole... U.S. foreign policy through the worldview of sort of this Cold War lens. And uh, I argue he sort of hijacked the Carter foreign policy. And Carter generally, you know, he couldn't manage this, unlike, I guess, George Washington. He couldn't manage these two uh, countering worldview and different points of view. And uh, it sort of undermined his presidency in the end, particularly when it came to dealing with the, the Iran revolution and the hostage crisis. And so it's a, it's a complicated, but very human story. Uh, you know, personality matters, the individual in history matters. And that's of course the strength of biography. Wow, well, uh, much like the CBS Evening News, the 30 minute mark here has come around way too quickly. So I want to say a, a deep word of gratitude to our three authors for joining us this evening, David O. Stewart, Kai Bird, James Oakes. I want to thank all of you for joining us and uh, for submitting your questions. And uh, I know you're gonna keep enjoying the National Book Festival and you can do that by going to loc.gov slash book best. Thanks so much. Till next time. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.